Hey folks, this is Buddy with B&G's Bees. Getting ready to do kind of an impromptu release, but I want to count them. Because being on a propagation permit, you need to let the uh, Department of Game and Inland Fisheries know how many you've released. So, uh, I've got some quail here that are five weeks old. Getting ready to turn them out. 96, 97. 98. Alright, we're too shy of having 100 for a release here. Alright, guys. So, what we have is uh, a bunch of five week old bobwhite that are learning their area. I'm going to sit out here with them for a while. Probably 90% if not all of these will not survive and that's one of the sad things about raising to release But uh, I don't have any other way of doing this We used to have a lot of quail in this area. I used to see literally cartwheels full of uh, Of these birds when I was a younger man in my 30s back here. I'm 63 years old now and we don't have a wild population of five white quail here. So I'm releasing them uh, hundreds per year to see if I can get them reestablished in this area. And I can only hope it'll work. This is my third year of releasing quail. There's no perfect way of doing it. There's people that do these uh, self-contained uh, raise and release pins uh, I quite frankly don't have the money for all of that and I've just got a bunch of breeder quail that are giving me about 60 eggs a day and I'm trying to hatch as many as possible and when they get to five weeks of age I'm releasing them now this is the first year I've done this at this young age I'm waiting until they're fully feathered out because I quite frankly don't want them to Acclimate, acclimate to being in a pen. I want them to I want them to start off at a younger age at being wild birds Now there is a ditch right between here and that white lane you see over there that has water in it uh, and every morning of course the dew drops off of the plants So uh, they're right here in a food plot that I have specifically for my my hunting area. But being that this is a food plot for a hunting area, there's also a uh, shadow. Come on over here. My dog being a cattle dog or a herd dog, he, uh, he likes to rein in all the quail and get them into a tight group. So I'm, I'm trying to go against his natural instincts right now. Here. 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 Okay. All right, folks, this is the first of many release for the year 2023. We've got at least uh, 
three more releases that are already in the brooder. I'll be doing this once a week. And uh, there are three more trays, actually four more trays in the incubator right now because one's in the hatcher, hatching tray. Uh, finishing out and drying so I can put them in a brooder. But you can see the quail out there. They're all along that edge over there picking through that dead grass. So, uh, Hopefully a lot of them, if not most of them, survive. And when, like I say, one of the things you'll find out if you go online and check into this type of stuff, they, uh, the uh, survival rate's not great when they're not raised. And quite frankly, uh, 50 to 60% of quail that are, that are raised in, uh, in the wild and never in captivity don't even make it there. Uh, they're at the bottom of the food chain out here. And so there's uh, there's no training for these guys. It's gonna be uh, hit or miss. And hopefully they'll do good. I'll, I'll know next year if I start hearing the uh, males start to uh, do the Bob White call or there's their call back sound that you may hear them doing now. That's the uh, chicks call back sound. There's some over there in the ditch area that are calling back and forth to these guys. And I'm just staying out here for a little bit so uh, in case a, a hawk flies overhead, I'll, me being here will keep them from coming down on them. That's pretty cool, one of those little chicks just flew uh, north of here, went right over top of the ditch and landed over on the other side on that light colored lane that I was showing you on the other side of the ditch. There's uh, one of the chicks is on a branch. He's centered in the picture right there, if you can see him. Right in the center of the picture, there's the chick, chick there. They're still too young to tell whether they're male or female. They have no idea what's out here, what wants to eat them, what will use them on their menu. Like I say, they're at the, they're at the bottom of the food chain here. It's like turning loose a bunch of mice in the middle of a snake head. But uh, I'm hoping for the best. I'm hoping we can get these guys reestablished in this area. Back in the 80s, me and a friend of mine that I used to work with did a lot of quail hunting together with a dog named Jake. Really good pointer. That would have been 86, 87. Uh, it would have been the uh, 86 hunting, 80, uh, fall of 86. And we got a lot of quail, and I'm gonna go ahead and let you just listen to these birds call back and forth. I just heard that fluttering. That was the chick that was up there on the branch that you were looking at earlier. It flew to the field to my right. Hoping these guys do well. I'm giving these birds every chance I can to uh, be good and healthy when they released at this point. Now if we got a driving rain, they would probably die of uh, overexposure. 
They're not fully feathered on their heads yet, but they do have feathers across the middle of their head going back from their bill down their neck. Their wings are there, their tails are there. They can fly. I mean, one, one just flew about uh, uh, 40 or 50 feet when it flew over across the ditch. So they are capable of keeping themselves warm as long as they can keep themselves dry. And as long as the weather's not too bad, even if they do get wet, they'll, they'll do okay. This hatch would have been five weeks ago this past Saturday, and today is Tuesday, May 20th. Today is uh, Monday, May 22nd. I'm going this route because I have four brooders. It's a uh, stacked brooder that I've had since the 1980s. I bought it through uh, Georgia Quail Farm or GQF Manufacturing out of Georgia. I bought the, I think I bought it in 83 or 84. Listen to this chick. This is all the chicks talking back and forth. Getting back to my brooder, um, I couldn't tell you the number of adults that I have. They're uh, just under a year old, and they are the layers of all the eggs that I've been hatching out this year, this being the first hatch. And I'm gonna go ahead and release those, and the last hatch that I have from them will, uh, will be kept over winter to be my breeders for next year. That way I don't have to keep buying new birds. I used a stacked battery breeder stack, um, uh, breeder cage last uh, year. But you end up getting less eggs. And the quail are not as healthy because you're, you're raising them on wire. I like keeping them on the ground. And they seem to do better on the ground. As long as you keep them clean and keep them watered and keep them fed and, and uh, do some things in there. That, uh, I, I throw a lot of grass clippings in and do what I can to keep uh, keep the litter down in there so they don't start. You know, once the disease gets started in these birds, it, it goes through them like wildfire. So your best bet is just to keep the disease from starting. So getting back to the brooder, what I do is I've got an incubator that's got three trays and a hatching tray. So we're running, uh, we were running 200 eggs, now we're running 250 eggs in per week. Uh, they're in there for 23 days and then they hatch. Uh, on the uh, 20th day, we put them in the hatching tray. Uh, that's on a Thursday. On the following Friday, we put more eggs in and that just keeps us going every week. We're putting the oldest tray in the hatching tray and on Thursday. And then on Friday, we're putting new eggs into a tray and putting them inside of the empty tray that we had just put in the hatching tray the previous, previous Thursday on that Saturday, which has, a, has us coming out with uh, anywhere between 100 and 200 uh, birds per week. By the time we get to that fifth hatch, I've only got four brooders and I'm just not gonna build any more cages. And quite frankly, I've been wanting to do this for a while, but it just doesn't feel right because they look so young. But it makes sense. I mean, this is what biologists tell you to do, to, you know, as soon as they get feathered out, get them out in the wild. Uh, their, their survivability rate is just as good at this age as it is when they're fully grown because they, uh, they've never been outside. And with uh, fully adult, they're not only fully adult, which would make you think, well, they can survive better, but they're more acclimated to living inside of a cage, and so they are not as flighty. Um, these guys are younger. They'll learn the hard way, most likely, but you know, when something comes to get them, they'll bust. And uh, somebody will be sacrificed to show the rest of them the reason why they have to bust. And 
and get up in the air. And, uh, and so hopefully a, a lot of these will grow to adulthood. They won't mate this year. Uh, the ones I'm gonna release in, in just a few hours are already mated and they'll probably go ahead and re-nest and uh, hopefully raise up some, but those are less likely to survive that have been in a cage since last year than these young ones because they have acclimated to uh, cage life. And so when I turn them out of the cage, uh, some of them will go out in the woods and, and pair up, but a lot of them just want to get back in the cage. So these guys are about 150 to 200 yards away from the cage. I'm, uh, like I said, I drove away from my house into a food plot. I call it my uh, east food plot, and I've got a west food plot out here that I hunt over. And uh, I've turned them loose right here, just, just off of the lane. I can show you the lane that we're on. It's, uh, it's this lane that comes from my gate up here, coming down my lane. And uh, all along the side of this thing here, we've got birds acclimating to uh, wild, wild living. And I hope they do very well. I really do. Nothing would please me more than uh, to end my days living here, hearing, uh, well, I take that back, nothing pleases me more than seeing somebody come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but it would really tickle me and my wife to uh, be able to hear the sounds of these birds from the wild instead of just for a few weeks after I turn them loose in the wild before something eats them. For some reason or other, these birds did very well out here without me or anybody else releasing them back in the 80s. And I would just love to see them get started back and become a part of the, the wildlife out here again. I've got a trip to Romania sometime in July. So uh, aside from that, I'll probably go ahead and upload these each week just to let you know how the uh, how the releases are going. And, and hopefully I'll be able to report back to you that I've seen some of the, the quail as they've been getting larger and, uh, and acclimating to life in the wild out here. one you're hearing right now is, uh, well, he just walked back into the, the foliage there. There's, we've got some uh, clover and small gum trees and oak, and wax myrtle. The partridge pea is just coming up. That won't, that won't put out a seed until these, these birds are about twice as big as they are right now, but there's, there's so much stuff out there. They're nipping at the clover. They're nipping at stuff on the ground. As chicks, they uh, and 90% of their food is is insect insects. So they just uh, they're doing what birds do. They're pecking at anything that moves, and it uh, it's palatable. They're gonna swallow it. <laughs> and they're testing the wings. This is just so cool to me. This is the kind of stuff I really enjoy.